Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Fadi Fatala, Professor and Chair of the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering at UC Davis. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the 13th year of the Citrus Research Exchange Seminar Series and uh, 21 years of Citrus Organization. Uh, Citrus has hosted a remarkable lineup of technology innovators in, in person at uh, Citarja Dai Hall. And we are glad to see uh, all of you joining us uh, virtually today for the fall 2021 series. Uh, today, uh, we are joined by Professor uh, Stavros Vujukas. Uh, professor Vujukas is, has, uh, is a professor in, in our department, the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering at UC Davis. And he received his PhD degree from Electrical Computers and Systems Engineering Department at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York. And his research focuses on robotics and automation for agriculture, uh, with emphasis on robot, robot aided and autonomous, uh, autonomous uh, harvesting. So uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Vajukas, and I'll, I'll hand the, the presentation to him. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Fadi, very much for the introduction. I will uh, share my screen so I can uh, proceed with my presentation. So uh, my lab is called Biotomation Lab, and its main mission is to, uh, to do research on labor savings technology for agriculture. Today's topic is going to be human-robot collaboration for fruit harvesting. And so uh, the lab's main directions are collaborative robotic harvest aids. These are technologies that do not replace people um, in, in, in the tasks that they're performing. They rather help them perform them faster uh, in a safer manner. Um, another area, uh, another direction is mechanical and robotic harvesting. This is where we uh, try to uh, automate the task. And then um, a third uh, direction is in general autonomous operations like navigation and manipulation uh, and sensing in orchards. So I will focus today on the first uh, topic, which is collaborative robotic harvest aids. So uh, a well-known fact, or maybe not as well known, is that every um, item, every fresh fruit or vegetable that we have on our table has been actually picked by a human hand. Could be table grapes, apples, strawberries, tomatoes, uh, cauliflowers, you name it. People are harvesting those crops. And, 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 and that has been uh, always the case and, and still is. Uh, but what has changed recently is that we are experiencing uh, severe farm labor shortages in California, in the USA, but also in, in, in many parts of the world. Um, the figure here shows you um, some results based on a, on a questionnaire on a survey that was sent out to farmers by UC Davis and the California Farm Bureau Federation in 2019. And, and what you see here is the answers uh, of farmers to the question, have you experienced labor shortages? And, and we see how the percentage of farmers that experienced such shortages in California increased from somewhere uh, at 13 or 14% 14 in 2014 to more than 40% uh, in 2018. Now, this is the most recent of you know, data from that survey, and it is pre-COVID. So the situation has really become much worse since 2018. So th this is a big challenge for uh, crop production, for our farmers. Uh, what are the implications when it comes to manual harvesting, which is the most labor intensive operation um, in, in fruit and vegetable production? Well, uh, first of all, we have increased production costs. So this graph, it's from the same paper and the same uh, data from the survey shows you the percent of farmers who raised the wages to attract enough workers. And you can see how that goes from 30% to 80% in 2018, and by now pretty much is 
Now, increasing wages is, of course, not a bad thing, especially for the workers. Um, but that doesn't mean but that by increasing the wages, you actually uh, overcome the labor shortage. The data shows that the situation has not improved. So although it's great and, and we should increase wages, uh, that is not uh, the solution pretty much. Uh, another outcome from uh, diminishing farm labor is that we have increased production risk, not only cost. Uh, the graph here shows you uh, that uh, a large percentage of uh, farmers, up to 25% in 2018, have changed their cultivation practices because of this labor shortage. Maybe they prune less or thin less their crops. 8% of them reported having delayed or reduced their harvesting because they didn't have enough workers, which means they're losing revenue. So uh, it, it's a pretty difficult situation. Now, one aspect is of course the cost and the production risk, but there is also another uh, issue related to um, all operations, especially harvesting being manual. And that is that we actually don't have any data related to crop production. Everybody talks about big data in agriculture, uh, and, and we get a lot of data for annual crops like wheat and soy, but when it comes to fresh fruits and vegetables, um, high value specialty crops, there is actually no data at all. And the reason is that everything is done manually. And, and the result of that is we, that we have suboptimal crop management. So, you know, we could fertilize less or uh, apply less chemicals and water. We also have suboptimal labor management and overall farm management without any data. Plus, we have reduced traceability. So we would really like to either automate entirely this task or, or improve the automation level. Now, uh, what about robotic harvesting? A lot is being written, has been written about robotic harvesting, and, and there are you know, several companies and research labs working in this in this area. Um, the technical feasibility of it, you know, strapping together a, a camera and some robot arm uh, and finding fruits on trees and picking them, that has been done since the 1980s. So, you know, we know we can do it, okay? Uh, and there is now a lot of research and development in this space for crops like uh, uh, strawberries and apples and kiwis and, and all other kinds of crops. Now, why was there uh, you know, a, a gap of 30 years almost that we didn't have much research in this topic? Well, of course, the labor shortage was not there. Uh, it wasn't as intense, uh, but we now have machine friendlier crops. So for example, you know, today's orchards are more structured and geometrical so it's easier for machines to work in them um, there are lots of advances in perception algorithms especially with deep neural networks and and pattern pattern recognition and image classification um, our ability to detect fruits uh, has increased a lot uh, hardware capabilities also uh, are much different than what they were even you know a few years back let alone 30 years back cost is less, and there is a lot of capital being infused into these efforts because there is a big demand for these machines. Uh, the problem is though that although technically we can harvest robotically, there are still pretty much no commercial units out there doing large scale harvesting with machines, with robots. What is the reason? The reason is that uh, harvesting doing it cost effectively is not easy. It is difficult. Two major parameters uh, decide, uh, determine whether a machine is profitable for, for, for harvesting. One is the picking efficiency. If there are a hundred fruits to be harvested, what percent of those fruits can the machine pick? If it's, if it's you know, 95 or more, that's great. This is what humans achieve. But if you only harvest 50% of your fruits, and the, the rest stays on the tree, that, that is a problem. And it turns out that 
this peaking efficiency, which is a percent, uh, it relies, it depends on the percent of visible fruit. Like, so if you can't see something, you can't really pick it. So what percent of fruits are visible actually? Then what percent of those are perceived by the robot? So visibility is more of a horticultural and biological issue. Uh, perception is a technical issue. What percent of that can be reached? This is more of a controls and mechanics issue for the machine, for the robot. What percent is detached successfully, you know, using a, a good gripper and uh, uh, control algorithms? And then what percent of those fruits is safely conveyed to a B? Now, if you think about it, the overall efficiency is the product of these terms. And so even if you have 95 or 96% efficiency in each of these stages, if you raise it to the power of five, you end up with 80%, which is not a very good efficiency. It's not commercially acceptable. The other uh, parameter is picking speed. How many fruits per second can you pick? And you know, factors that enter here are of course perception, how long it takes to acquire the image and do the fruit detection localization, how long it takes mechanically to reach those fruits, detach them and bring them back to, to a bean. And in this case, you have to add all those times that it takes. And again, if there is a bottleneck, if one of those operations is slow, it slows down the process to the point where the machine may be fine, it can harvest, but it's not really commercially justifiable. So this is the big challenge of agricultural robotics. They are at the intersection of robotics and automation. We need the flexibility and adaptability of robots and the perception ability of, of robots, but we also need the, uh, the efficiency and the speed and the reliability of hard automation or manufacturing automation. Um, well, uh, an intermediate step toward automation is to not really replace people, but develop technologies that increase the efficiency of people. Uh, and, and this is what I would like to focus on today. So the first case study and example will focus on strawberries. If you've never been in a strawberry field, um, um, harvesting is very hard work. This is a, a picker on the left using a, a little cart where they place their paper tray. Uh, they put the strawberries in, in clams in the tray. Once the tray is full, they run or walk very fast to the edge of the field to deliver the full tray, take an empty tray, go back. And they do it very fast because they are paid piece rate. The more trays they pick, the more money they make. Now, these fields are pretty long. They can be uh, 300 feet long. Uh, so you can imagine that these people spend a lot of time walking or running in order to do this trade transportation. So uh, it turns out that it, it's actually 10 to 20% or even more of their time that is being wasted, if you will, walking. Is there a better way to do this? Well, there are machines like the one that I'm showing here that are very large and they, um, they move slowly in front of the pickers and the pickers don't need to walk to the edge of the field. They simply deposit their trays on the machines. However, ever these are costly, very large, uh, cannot be deployed easily. Um, and if you have 12 or, or, or 14 people working together on a machine, some are faster, some are slower. They have different amounts of fruit in front of them. So this coupling reduces greatly the efficiency of the machine. Is there another way? Well, this is what I'm going to present today uh, based on a lot of the work that uh, my ex-PhD student uh, did, uh, Dr. Chen. And so uh, this is what we developed. Uh, and what you see here is a robot, a small robot, which is a harvest aid. What that robot does is 
it finds the right picker and goes to the picker when their tray is almost full. The picker leaves the full tray on the robot, takes an empty tray from the robot. The robot autonomously goes to the edge of the field. So the picker doesn't need to walk up to the, uh, to the headland. And then if you have more than one of those robots, you can have a robot team or fleet. They can coordinate, they can uh, 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 collaborate with the pickers. And the idea is that overall, you can increase the efficiency of the operation. So this is what this project was about. And this shows you uh, the operation at fast forward speed. So these machines, these robots are fully autonomous. Um, they go to the picker, to the pickers, get their trays, come back, uh, get reloaded with empty trays. And this is going on for hours and hours every day. Um, and, and, and so you can think of them as warehouse Amazon or Kiva robots doing transportation, or you might even think of them as, as an Uber service for, for strawberries, right? Um, so they do the infield logistics. Well, the question is, how, how can we do this? How can we um, build and program this fleet so that it collaborates with the pickers? Uh, this project was funded by um, USDA NIFA under the National Robotics Initiative uh, of uh, NSF and other agencies. And it was um, a collaboration of uh, several PIs, including Professor Fatala uh, from UC Davis. So here's the scoop. Um, the question is, how can the robots know what picker to go to and when? Ideally, you want the robot to go to a picker when the picker needs them. You don't want the picker, though, to wait for the robot because you are wasting their time. And you don't want the, the robot to go too early because you are wasting the robot's time. So it, it, it takes coordination. Timing is important. How can the robots tell when to go and where to go uh, to do the logistics? So the idea was the following. This is a cart that they already use. It's, it's a $40 uh, wire cart. However, we, we added some electronics on it. So there is a GPS unit uh, and you can see the antenna right here. Uh, and there are load cells under this unit. So in real time, we can measure the weight um, of the strawberries being picked. And, and that weight is shown um, here. And then we also record the weight as a function of position. So you can see here a yield map. Now, this weight, the timestamps, the locations of the pickers are all wirelessly transmitted to a computer in the field. That computer acts as an, as an intelligent scheduler that then sends commands to the robots in order to go to the right picker at the right time. Well, the question now becomes, how do you schedule them correctly? If you wait for a picker, uh, and, and by the way, there is a button on those cards that the picker can push to let the robots know that he or she will need service. So how can we predict where to go and when to go there? Because if you wait for a picker to finish harvesting and then the robot needs to travel 200 feet to the picker, that would be useless. The, the picker would have to wait for a minute or two um, and then they, they would not wait. They would just walk and, and the whole thing wouldn't work. So we need to do predictive scheduling. You need, we need to be able to predict how do we do that? Well, uh, the robot fleet has an internal model, a hybrid system model of the picker and robot operations. Uh, this is you know, a, a diagram of the finite state machine, the transitions shown here. The parameters of this model, for example, uh, how fast does a picker walk or how fast do they fill a tray? Those parameters are identified in real time by using the data from the cards. And then 
having that data in real time, um, the, uh, the scheduler can use the model to predict when the transport needs to be done and where. So this is a figure here that shows you, for example, these uh, uh, orange bars. This is a predicted service request. This is the, uh, the scheduling saying the robot fleet will need to go here. And there is, of course, some uncertainty in that prediction. So this is the range of locations you need to go to. And it gives you also a, a window of times that you should get there. So now we know or the scheduler knows where to go and when to go. But of course, there is uncertainty in that prediction. And then what does it do? It uses an approach called multiple scenarios. So what the scheduler does is it, it samples the uncertainty that is associated with the location and the time where the service request will arise. And then it samples that uncertainty to generate possible scenarios. It's like saying, okay, I need to be uh, at the movie theater at 9 p.m. And so I will need an Uber or Lyft to come to me about 15 minutes in advance. It could be 13 minutes or it could be 17 minutes, depending on, on the situation. Uh, so there's some uncertainty there. And also, maybe I want to be picked up by you know, the, the service in front of my apartment, my house, but that could be also, you know, plus or minus 50 or 100 feet away. So these are all possibilities. Our scheduler samples the probability density functions of those uncertainties and creates different possible scenarios. Those scenarios are deterministic. Maybe you have 100 of them or 20 of them. But each of those scenarios is one situation where the robots need to serve uh, the, uh, the requests at specific places and times. Now, if you have, let's say, 10 different scenarios, you can then do some numerical optimization so that you schedule your team for each scenario independently. So you come up with 10 different possible schedules. For this, for this set of scenarios. Of course, you can't really run all of them. You can't execute all of them. You have 10 of them. The idea of the approach is that you use a consensus function to compute one scenario that's not optimal, but it's robust. It's near optimal and it's robust, which means that whichever of those scenarios really uh, materializes once the robot starts to move to that location, uh, the, the robot schedule will not be uh, too bad if things change and, 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 and dynamics come in and then the, uh, uh, the service needs to be somewhere else or a little bit later or earlier. So at the end, we have one scenario which may not be optimal, but it's robust. And then that scenario is provided to the robot fleet. So this is the implementation of the system. Uh, down here, this is a, a field computer that runs software. Uh, these are the pickers with their cards. Uh, we get wirelessly data from the cards that goes through um, um, a, a lot of uh, wireless technology onto the server. We do the prediction of the requests. We do the predictive scheduling in real time, and then the dispatching commands are sent wirelessly over Wi-Fi to the robot team. And then the robots, once they have their mission, they autonomously do all the path tracking, the path, pl path planning, path tracking, controls, etc. Uh, these are you know, two robots that we used. And this is a number of cards. Uh, we currently have about uh, 30 of those uh, for the fleet. Now, we run experiments in. Uh, in California in early November 2020 uh, during commercial harvesting. So this is not a lab experiment or something we, we did amongst ourselves. This is real world commercial harvesting. Uh, because we only have two robots due to budget constraints, 
uh, we use those robots with a, a group of seven workers maximum. So there were four workers, five, six, seven. We wanted to see how performance changes as we um, change the people to robot ratio. Uh, the main result coming out of this work, out of these tests, is that when, they, when the workers harvested manually, like they do now, um, they spent almost 23% of their time walking back and forth. When the robots were deployed, they spent about 11% of their time walking uh, or uh, uh, idle, you know, waiting for the robots or walking if the robots denied them service. Because something that I didn't uh, explain uh, earlier is that if the robot fleet decides, knows that uh, a picker may be too close to the, to the unloading station, and so it would take more time for the fleet to serve them, it makes no sense. So it will refuse service to a picker. Uh, there is a certain light that turns on the cart, so the picker knows that they have to walk. Um, so based on this data, we saw an average efficiency increase of about 12%, which is pretty significant. You can either make 10% or 12% more money, you can uh, harvest 12% more acreage, or you could have 12% fewer people. Uh, by the way, this was done in November, which is very late in the harvesting season of strawberries in California. If you do the same experiment in um, June or July or August, uh, we have predicted that the gains would be 20 to 25%. So, so this technology can actually increase efficiency a lot. Uh, now, some food for thought. Uh, these algorithms operate with an objective function of increase, optimizing efficiency or minimizing the waiting time of the pickers for a robot to come. Because clearly, if you have seven pickers and two robots, then the robot is a shared resource and you need to do all this intelligent scheduling. Um, and the question is, okay, if you increase efficiency, you might even maximize it. You might even have a solution that allows zero time for the pickers to walk. They don't need to walk at all. However, if they spend eight hours in a day just stooped over the beds picking, that's definitely not good for their ergonomics, for their uh, health. And so what if we change the objective function of the, of the system, or if we introduced constraints in the optimization that dealt with ergonomics? Another issue is, are the robots fair? What does that mean? Not all pickers are as fast or as efficient uh, others are slower because they're older or more tired. Others are faster. And so one could envision incorporating into those objective functions and constraints uh, other objectives or, or have weighted criteria where instead of maximizing the overall efficiency of the crew, you start talking about minimizing the, uh, the difference or the variance in the service you provide to the pickers. Or you might think of situations where if a picker is slower, then you favor them and you go to them more often in order for them to make more money, for example, um, and, and maybe bring them to the same level with a fast picker. These are all decisions and policies that could be implemented through the software, but we haven't really touched them but it, it, it's a very interesting direction because we are talking about machines and humans working together. Um, I, next, I will uh, present another project, which is again along the same lines in the same direction of research. How can we use machines and uh, people to work together in a safer and uh, uh, better way? This project, again, was uh, under the National Robotics Initiative umbrella, uh, and it's a collaboration with Carnegie Mellon University that worked on the perception part. 
um, and it, it's, it's uh, to a large extent the work of uh, uh, Zeng Haofei, um, an ex PhD student of mine. So what's what's the what's the deal here? Well, like I said, everything is harvested manually, and, and you know, forget now strawberries and blueberries and blackberries. Let's talk apples or, or citrus. You know, those are harvested by people climbing on tall ladders um, and carrying big bags. Those ladders can be 16 feet tall or, or even taller. Those bags, when they're full, that could, they could be 20 kilograms heavy. And you can imagine somebody going up and down the ladder, then uh, moving the ladder around the tree, uh, uh, very labor intensive, very, very risky. And once your bag is full, you have to walk to, uh, to the beans that are laid down in the orchard, unload your bag, go back, climb, very, very inefficient and dangerous. Now, there are machines out there called orchard platforms, and this is one of them, where you can have your crew work on the platform so they don't need to climb ladders and walk. This is much safer. It increases their efficiency. And usually you have four to six people work on these platforms. Uh, their decks have multiple levels. So uh, they are set at different heights. And then the pickers are standing on those decks and harvest. Now, when pickers are, are standing at those different heights, we do what we call fixed zone harvesting. So you allocate one picker to harvest at a zone one, which is a higher zone. And then you allocate another picker to harvest in zone two, which is a lower zone. And that's how things are done today. Could this be a problem? Could the fact that you pre-allocate people to different zones of the orchard canopy present a problem? Well, let me give you some facts first. Fact number one is that the distribution of fruits are not uniform as you go from the bottom to the top of the tree and as you move along uh, a row in the orchard or as you change rows. So this, this graph shows you an example of a tree distribution or a fruit distribution. The horizontal axis is walking um, uh, parallel to the trees along the row. The vertical axis is the height of the trees in meters. You can see fruit density ranges from zero fruits uh, per uh, 0.1 square meter to 20 fruits. So that's fact number one. Fact number two is that we are dealing with people and each person, each worker will harvest at a different speed because of their innate ability, but also that speed may change over time. They get hot, they get tired. Um, and so these are two very important facts to consider. Why could those facts present an issue? So think of the platform as it is going into the orchard. The incoming fruits, you can think of them as the demand for labor. And the picking speed of the pickers, you can think of it as labor supply. Now, since we have fixed zone harvesting, there is always a mismatch between the labor supply and the labor demand. The supply is the pickers, the demand is the fruits. And that imbalance, that mismatch, reduces the harvesting speed of the machine, of the, of the crew itself, of the, of the crew as a collective. Another issue is that the platform speed should match the fruit load and the picker speeds. Think of it. If you are going very fast, if you are uh, uh, driving very fast, the pickers don't even have the time to pick fruit. So efficiency goes down. If you go very slowly, the pickers pick all the fruit and then they're idle. There is nothing for them to pick because they are still in front of an empty area. So there is a sweet spot uh, for speed, but unfortunately, 
speed control nowadays is manual and done by a picker. And as a result, that picker wastes time because they don't pick, but also speed control is imperfect. So the project that I'm describing here, its goal was to build a better harvest aid platform by making a robot out of conventional platforms. So the approach was to place a 3D camera in front of the platform that builds a fruit map in real time, thus characterizing the demand for labor. Second, there is a computer that controls the elevations, the lifts of the pickers, so that if we measure picker speeds, which we do, we can match uh, the fruit load and the picker speeds. We can match labor supply and demand. And then finally, the computer can optimize the travel speed. So you can think of this machine now as a robot, which it is, it's autonomous, and then the people are actually riding that robot and working on it, from it, and how well they pick depends on the robot itself, on, on how it operates. So this is the hardware. Uh, there is a high precision GPS, a 3D camera, um, and a, an instrumented picking bag that gives us uh, uh, picking speed data. Uh, this is the map of the fruits, of the incoming fruits provided by the 3D camera. All of this information goes onto a controller that uh, is implementing uh, a sparse Monte Carlo search in the state space, in the, in the control state space. And it's trying to optimize the, the lift elevations and the speed of the platform, um, having discretized those actuation commands and, and running um, a search in real time. So once the controller has the desired actions, and this is more of a predictive controller because it acts based on the incoming fruits, which are in front of the platform, not behind it or at the platform. Uh, then these commands are sent to the hydraulic cylinders that control the lifts and the hydraulic motor that controls the speed of travel of the platform. Uh, this is a picture of the actual machine. Uh, again, these are the two pickers, and you can see one lift in the back, one lift in the front. The, the platform moves forward. It's self-propelled. Uh, there is a bin where the pickers unload the fruit inside this bin. Uh, this is one of the hydraulic cylinders controlled by the computer. This is the second cylinder. Uh, GPS antenna and unit, 3D camera, and then uh, the computer in the back, that's the brain of the machine. Now, we did experiments in commercial apple uh, orchards, especially one in Lodi, California in 2019, uh, with two pickers harvesting from one side of the platform. We automated, robotized only one side, again, due to budget uh, limitations. Uh, we did harvesting with a conventional mode, which is, you know, the platform was stupid. It was just moving as they move now. Uh, and then we did it in full core robotic mode where the platform was smart and autonomous. It optimized speed and height control. And we collected about uh, 1.8 thousand uh, kilograms of apples in the robotic mode and 1.4 thousand kilograms of apples in the manual mode. Now, we did two types of picking with clipping and not clipping the stems. This is a video uh, of the platform. We would use the sound level. Uh, this is an older version of the camera, but you can see here, uh, it's moving slowly in the orchard and then the pickers uh, are picking. So uh, you will see the lift going up uh, or down directly controlled by the uh, computer. Now results, and I will go through very, uh, very fast. Uh, this is the rear picker. This is the front picker. 
when uh, when they were clipping the stems, which is a task that takes a little bit of uh, skill. They have a little scissor in their hands, and the, after they uh, pluck the apple, they clip the stem. We can see that the rear picker was much faster than the front picker. One was harvesting 280 kilograms per hour, the other only 190. The total speed of harvesting combined was 235 kilograms per hour. But that was the manual mode. When we switched into collaborative robotic mode, you can see that the overall speed went up to 262. So it increased by 11%. And the interesting thing is that the two pickers, their performance is not that different. So the machine achieved some load balancing. When no clipping was done, the results were even better because the pickers were already harvesting at similar speeds. And so the, the, the robot was able to increase the performance by 26%. That's a big improvement in terms of cost or time um, and efficiency. So take home messages from uh, today's presentations. Uh, presentation, robots can and have been proved and shown to increase people's harvest efficiencies. And they provide us a lot of valuable data like yield maps, labor related data, etc. cetera. Uh, it is a cost effective technology that's ready for commercialization. We are already working with one company to license the, the robot fleet uh, idea. Uh, and it can be extended to other operations like pruning or thinning trees. So it's not only for harvesting. It can also, the same concepts also apply to robotic harvesters because uh, robotic harvesters with multiple arms will still face the challenge of load supply and demand. A very important topic is how do we program these machines because they will directly affect the farm workers efficiency of course so their income but also their safety and their long-term health their ergonomics and based on that they will affect the perception of the robots by the humans by the workers and robot adoption if, if the workers don't want the, the, the robotized harvest aids they cannot be uh, used um, in the orchards. So, so this is very important. Algorithms can do that in, in this context. And so the question for further research is who and how get to decide what the robots offer? Do we maximize efficiency? Do we incorporate fairness of service or longer term ergonomic uh, uh, benefits? How do we balance this from a cost point of view? These are extremely interesting questions that we, we are investigating and hope to investigate. And so if anybody's interested in, uh, in collaborating in this area, uh, we would be thrilled to work with you. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for um, being with uh, me today. And um, I would be happy to um, answer any questions that uh, the audience had to uh, um, provide. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Majukas. I uh, think trying to see if there are any questions uh, from the participants. If you have any questions, please put it in the Q and A. Uh, I'll I'll start I'll start with one uh, to get get us going. Um, so I, I, you said the cost effectiveness uh, of the platform is is there, but um, is there a capital investment that the you know a grower if they're considering that type of uh, approach? Is it a big capital investment, or they they have to kind of work it out over years to kind of recoup that that capital investment? How I'm, I'm assuming you're looking at these things, right? That, that, that is a great question, and, and, and the answer is not easy. What I mean is, since this is you know, a, a prototype, we know the cost. Now, for example, each of those robots is about $7,000. So it's not a very expensive machine. But if you, you, know, if you think of commercial uh, um, 
adoption and you know how much would they sell for and then how do you store them how do you deploy them maintain them the cost goes up of course but the question also is what business model will be uh, used are these machines going to be uh, owned by the grower or uh, would would there be a company that provided them as a service um, and, and currently a lot of the startup companies in the area of robotic harvesting or harvest aid robots uh, they are looking into the service model which is you know we come and bring the robots we operate them and we charge you uh, uh, mm. a certain rate um, uh, but but also you know the, the alternative model is considered um, according to some initial studies uh, and some claims of course from startup companies uh, you can you, the return on investment is one to two years it can be very very fast because we are looking at you know 15 to 20 percent increases in efficiency that that can be a lot of money uh so it is i don't have numbers of course but this is something that people are looking into yeah great thank you um we have a, another question from uh suma ready uh, she thanks you for of course first and then you mentioned that there are uh, other applications for harvest aids like pruning and, and robotic uh, harvesters uh, uh, load supply and, and demand and could you elaborate on this like what, how can that technology be implemented in other other circumstances yes so uh, one example especially in orchards uh, with tree fruits or vineyards uh, is operations that are very labor intensive, like pruning. So, uh, you know, in orchards to prune, either you climb on a ladder, which is the old fashioned way, or you, you, you are on a platform and then you operate from the platform. So if you think of the platform now as, as an intelligent machine or, or an automated machine, uh, the, uh, the pruning is is action that that gives you the labor supply so you might have six people on the platform or four doing the pruning again each person will have different skills different speeds so managing even you know what we did with the platform the elevation and the speed would be important um, but in addition to that pruning for example takes a lot of skill so you can imagine situations where the robot is running algorithms that, that embed pruning skills or pruning knowledge based on machine learning models from skilled pruners. And then they can, uh, they can show the pruners where to cut, for example. So either in an augmented reality type of approach or by you know, throwing some beam of light, you could uh, have the machine improve the quality of the work, not only the speed, by helping out the, uh, the people. Um, again, there are thinning operations where they, they use hand tools to remove some of the small fruits in order to eliminate clusters and have larger fruits, but fewer. Again, this is another example of, of such operations. Um, so, so there are other operations where you can use these, these types of technologies. Um, and plus, uh, for example, the, the fleet technology, the, the robot team, even if we have or when we have robotic fully automated harvesters, imagine a, um, a strawberry harvester machine, okay? It's going to be designed, optimized to pick. Uh, if that machine, after it, its capacity is full, goes back to deliver those strawberries, it is wasting time for traveling back and forth, doing logistics. So you can still imagine robots that do transportation um, and serve machines, not people. So the similar concepts can apply to these situations, just like with large scale grain harvesting, you may have a combine harvester that costs $1 million, but then there are unloading trucks that work around that machine to carry back and forth uh, the grain or carry it from the combine harvester to uh, the edge of the field, because that machine needs to be utilized 100%. So these are some 
other possibilities or uh, ideas. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, uh, says, uh, do the aid do the aid of the robots reduce the salary of the pickers? So, for, how does it affect the workers, basically? Did, did you get that question, uh, Stavros? Yes. Oh, did, did you hear my question or the question? No, no, I'm sorry, I didn't. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, there, there was another qu question just came in. It says, uh, do the aid of the robots reduce the salary of the pickers? So how does it affect the, the does it change the pay structure for the, for the workers? Great question. So when we did our experiments, um, the pickers were paid the same way. And actually it was ensured that if there were problems with the hardware, et cetera, so it slowed them down, they would still make at least as much money as they would make uh, uh, without the robots. Uh, but that was a decision of the grower. Now- Connecting, now you're on. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my, my router went dead. So I'm, I'm connecting through my phone now. I'm terribly sorry for that. Um, so uh, if this is still relevant, uh, yeah, the, the question was, it really depends on the, on the pay model, but there is, there is the possibility or the opportunity for the pickers to make more money and for the grower to make more money or at least have enough labor to uh, harvest their fields. Great, thank you. So I think uh, yes, those are all of our Q and A questions. Yeah. Do we have Do you have any uh, other questions? No. Okay. So I think uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Vajukas, uh, and uh, I think we we can conclude the the seminar. And thank you for, thank you again thank for joining. And, and sorry for the for the technical stuff. Go ahead, Sabi. Yeah. My apologies. That's okay. Those That's things okay. happen. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks, thanks for your talk. It was really interesting. We loved it. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.